feel free to browse in it. I want to call to the stage um, a carpenter from the Netherlands. Well, he's he an amateur carpenter, and he's been an Israeli person for the last few years. And he's also the cybersecurity coordinator at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for, Foreign Affairs in the Israeli government. So I would like to call to the stage Ido Moed. Ido, the stage is yours. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to have so many of you here to join us for this uh, a crucial topic that is uh, around norms in cyber. Uh, please allow me to invite to the stage our two speakers. First, uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs from Estonia, Ms. Marina Kalturant, who is uh, right now also the head of the Commission of uh, Stability in, uh, and Security in Cyberspace. And together with her, Professor Joe Nye from Harvard. Please welcome them to the stage. Well, I hope they are arriving. Um, before they do, um, I want to set the setting for our discussion. And uh, I'm most probably they are lost somewhere behind stage. They will join us in a second. Uh, the discussion about norms and the uh, issue of what kind of guidance do states need in cyberspace has been quite, has been developing quite for a long time. Actually, some people say that it's about 20 years that it's developing and we still don't have any kind of a universal cyber agreement. We don't have any uniform, international understanding how states should behave uh, in cyber. And we hear with the development of more and more cyber attacks that we should have one. Recently, Secretary General from the United Nations, um, Gutierrez, said that we need some kind of uh, code or rules for uh, behavior in an electronic domain in order for us to protect civilians. Please welcome our two speakers. Great that you join us. I must say that this term, fireside chat, in Israel, in about 30 degrees outside, <laughs> is a bit problematic <laughs> to me. So I can imagine that it takes some time to get it. Uh, but welcome, welcome to the panel. Uh, I just mentioned the, uh, my introduction that norms, uh, the idea of norms and the discussion about norms in cyberspace has not uh, brought us yet to some kind of a universal agreement. Uh, states are trying to come to terms with it, and although about 20 years have passed since we start discussing this, we are not there yet. So I would like to hear from you um, to start these conversations, this conversation, uh, why do we need norms? Do we need them? We've been there, we've been talking about this for 20 years. We know from experience that uh, nuclear negotiations take a lot of time. We know that there are a lot of players that are not states. So do we really need this norms discussion? Marina, why don't you start? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it's my second time to be here at this conference and it's always a pleasure to come to Tel Aviv and, and thank you so much for having me and needless to say how honoured and privileged I am to be together with Professor Nye on the stage whom I greatly admire and respect. But coming to the norms, I'm a lawyer by education and I'm a politician by profession. So I do understand the difference between international law and voluntary norms. What I would say is that we need clarity in cyberspace. We need clear understanding what is allowed, what is not, and what happens if somebody is doing something that is not allowed. And here I speak as a lawyer. We have agreed globally that international law applies to cyber, full stop. To be more precise, we have agreed that UN Charter in its entirety applies to cyber. But the question how exactly we so far as governments 
have not been able to answer, well, let's say in very convincing terms. There is great academic work done in that sphere, but governments are the ones who apply and interpret international law, and that part uh, so far has not been fully done. And here come norms into the, into the place. So I also see a space for norms. And if I, I'd like to say maybe three key words in this field, and they are clarity, cooperation, and multi-stakeholder approach. So I'll stop here. So, well, yes, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that uh, there already are some norms. Ed Marina just <coughs> mentioned that there's agreement that the uh, UN Charter and uh, international law applies. But there are areas like criminal uh, behavior, where you have the Budapest Convention, uh, which provides a set of norms. And in, in general, the idea that the, uh, that the internet is the wild west with no norms uh, simply mistakes the point that the internet is so integrated with the rest of activity that a lot of the norms are important. For example, norms related to trade, or norms related to intellectual property and so forth, they exist and they affect the internet. So we, we do live in a world which already has a certain amount of norms. The question is, what extra norms do we need to develop for the internet? And that's where the work that Marina and her colleagues at the UN Group of Government Experts uh, was taking some of these norms like international law and trying to apply them particularly uh, and restraining states in their conflicts. All right, so we need norms. We can agree on that. Then who, who should set the norms? That perhaps will be the following question. Um, some people say, uh, like a uh, researcher like Alexander Klimberg, who wrote uh, The Darkening Web, uh, he mentioned the uh, technological Pandora box. And he says states are trying to peek into that, and they don't understand what they've opened. And the question is, do who has the capacity and the capability to set these norms? Well, I, in academic uh, circles, sometimes people talk about norm entrepreneurs. And a norm entrepreneur can be an individual, it can be a, a group, it can be a government. The, the UNGGE, which we just mentioned, is a norm entrepreneur. But so is the commission that Marina is chairing the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace. Uh, it's trying to suggest ideas and a process for implementing these ideas. So, so norms can be generated by a variety of entrepreneurs. The question is, when do they cascade into broader acceptance and become internalized? And that's often a slow process. If, if I might be able sure. on what Joe said, uh, cybersecurity is recognized as a field of security. International security, national security, nobody's questioning that anymore. But cybersecurity is a field where governments alone are useless because there are so many other actors, academia, IT society, civil society, private sector. And in recent years, we have seen that all those other actors are also active uh, active players in that field. Microsoft with its tech accord, Siemens with its shot of trust, the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, where I'm really happy and privileged to have also Joe with us, has introduced two norms on protection of the public core of internet and on protection of elections. Uh, Carnegie Endowment, protection of integrity of financial data, and government. So we see that all stakeholders want to have their role and are ready to cooperate. Very often, it is behind the states. For states, it's difficult to understand that cyber is different from nuclear or chemical or other weapons, that in cyber, they need cooperation with others. And I think that everybody agrees the best IT experts are not in governmental sector. They are in private sector. And governments have to cooperate with them if they want to have the best knowledge. So I don't think that governments are opening a Pandora box that they shouldn't do. They have to do it, but they have to do it in cooperation with other stakeholders. Okay, so we need norms. We need to challenge technology. The next question will be, 
how do we enforce them and how do we bridge the, the gap of time? We know that processes of norm setting take a long time. <laughs> Even if you have a sort of a non-binding organization and everybody's really motivated to pitch in, the discussions take time. And of course, within bureaucracies and states, norm setting takes also a long time. So how do you bridge the time gap and how do you really deal with the issue of enforcing those norms and making sure that they're implemented? I think that's the crucial question, which is the technology in cyber is so volatile that we may not have the time we need. We just saw this morning this exponential growth in the connections to the internet. Uh, one of the graphs showed 18 billion connections in this year, 2018, and then the curve just goes up. Uh, it's changing so rapidly that the question is, will we be able to develop norms in time? If you look at norms, for example, on control of nuclear weapons, it took about two decades before you began to get arms control agreements and so forth. It's not clear we have two decades. If you, if you watch these graphs or saw these graphs that we saw this morning, and that's the part that, that worries me. Uh, yes, first of all, I think that, again, governments have to think out of the box and then should, they should start dealing with the matters of tomorrow, not today. I bring you an example. I very often bring it, so I'm sorry if I repeat it. I don't know whether there's somebody from Finland here, but Finland has a company, Tieto, which has already artificial intelligence, a robot in the board of directors. She's a lady, her name is Alicia, and she has the same power, the same obligations, the same responsibilities as humans sitting on the board of directors, but there is still no law regulating her uh, obligations, regulating her liabilities. So it's the, it's the last time for states to start looking into that, to start setting some standards, because there are many things where states have to be the, the engine that starts the process and engages with others. And another point, I don't know, maybe we need cybersecurity watch like we have Human Rights Watch, somebody who is monitoring the norms, whether they are being fulfilled or not, what is the state practice, how do states approach those who violate norms. I know that states are pretty hesitant with attribution and going public with attribution, but recently we have had several cases of attribution where states went public and were supported by other states. I was just going to add on to uh, what Marina said that I think if you look on this uh, issue of uh, norms, you'll find little areas which may get ahead or more quickly. I mean, I mentioned crime, where, where there's a good deal of cooperation in Interpol as well as the Budapest Convention. But uh, uh, there are areas where you can separate out. For example, this agreement that uh, U.S. and China reached in September of 2015, which is you wouldn't use cyber espionage for commercial purposes. Doesn't mean no espionage. Espionage is as old as human history. But on that particular agreement, it was then taken to the G20 and broadened somewhat. Uh, another area which may be uh, more difficult is this Russian interference in elections. Uh, they basically took information warfare, which is as old as history, but it certainly both used it in the Cold War, but they applied a technology, the, the internet and cyber technology, to update it. And it was, a, it was a bold doctrinal stroke. And the question is, is it possible to imagine a norm which holds that back or holds it down? In the Cold War, despite our differences, the U.S. and Russia agreed on norms to regulate incidents at sea. So our two navies didn't uh, bump into each other, so to speak. Uh, I wonder if we can think of areas where we could get some norms on, on issues of this sort. So in others, rather than imagining a big U.N. treaty or some grand uh, settlement, which I don't think we'll have, uh, can we isolate some areas and see whether we can negotiate? And that's going to take uh, not just goodwill, it's going to take threats and sanctions. If, if, I, if yes, I may, uh, what Joe said, very much agree with that. Uh, 
And uh, uh, Estonia proposed already in 2013 in the UNGG a norm uh, not to attack financial systems during peacetime. It came from our experience, 2007 cyber attacks against Estonia, the first target were our banks. So we thought that it's a good norm. Everybody should be interested. Uh, banking system is the backbone of economy. Not to attack during peacetime banking systems. When I talked in the corridors with different delegations, everybody said, excellent idea. As soon as we entered the room of negotiations, political statements started. So very often, if an initiative comes from one state, being it Israel or Estonia or Singapore or United States, Weimar, it's difficult to support it. So in those cases, I would suggest to look at what other multi-stakeholders are proposing. Neutral, apolitical platforms, commissions, organizations. So I very much hope that maybe now, it's, as it has been proposed by Carnegie, maybe it will be easier for states to accept this as a norm. Um, thank you for that. It seems that we can agree fairly easily about what we can do, what we should do, set our priorities. But as you mentioned uh, just now, Joe, there, are, there is China, you mentioned Russia, and the question is really how do you incorporate them in the discussion if you want to have universal law, uh, rules or norms, if you want to have uh, more stability, more security, which you're all aspiring for. So the question is, now with the recent um, attributions to uh, Russia, to North Korea, to Iran, and as Chris mentioned, Christopher Painter mentioned yesterday that evidently there is also a rise again in Chinese attacks against the United States in spite of their agreements. How do you incorporate those players that may seem to be antagonists to such a discussion? Well, there's some areas where uh, you can incorporate them relatively easily. If you take the first norm that Marina's commission created, which is don't our it, commission. our commission, uh, has created, well, you're the chair, <laughs> uh, which uh, the commission has brought forth, which is to not interfere with the basic structure of the internet, domain name system and so forth. The Chinese have an interest in that. Uh, and so you can imagine agreement on that norm, which is independent of ideology. Now, if we try to get a norm regulating content, uh, freedom of speech, obviously we'd have trouble. And our second uh, uh, norm that we're proposing about not interfering in elections, that's going to be harder because there, for example, elections in China and Russia don't mean what they mean in the West. Marina, you, you, you said you have to think out of the box. You have to think out of the box, and I do believe that international cooperation is crucial. Well, I'm a diplomat, and I will die as a diplomat. I believe in diplomacy. I believe in talking to each other, to listening to each other. But what's difficult is that when we say the same words, but we have different understanding. In the United Nations, everybody agrees that the internet has to be open, free, accessible, safe, secure. And at the same time, we see that some states are acting not in accordance with these principles. So international cooperation has to be there, but we have to be realistic. Today, with this ideological division we have, we can't agree anything new on international law, applicability of international law, and on, uh, on many norms. Yes, there are some specific norms where we can agree, but not on everything. That's the reality. And then we have to continue working with like-minded, with those who share our understanding of what is free, open, secure, safe, accessible internet. But it shouldn't be an exclusive club for selected nations. It should be an open club. Everybody who shares the principles should be part of the like-minded group that will continue working with more touchable and more realistic results on norms and, and uh, following the norms uh, and application of international law. So both tracks. I don't exclude. I don't want to say that there is only one right track. But the larger cooperation is important also from the perspective of capacity building. I, also, I bring the example that maybe out of 193 countries, 50 do know what cybersecurity is. 140 do not have a clue. But we have to reach out to them.
because they are the weak link and they need the assistance and they need capacity building, they need confidence building and they need trust. That's a very good point about the 50 countries that are familiar with the concept of cyber, 100 countries, 140 countries maybe that are not because the question that can be drawn or the conclusion that can be drawn from what you just said, Marina, is that maybe we are into a process of fragmentation of the internet. And is that a process that we want? What do we do with the 140 countries that all of us want to share our knowledge and information, want to know them, want to f allow them also to prosper and grow economically, socially? We want to have this open network. Uh, How do I, I'd maintain like to clarify. That? I don't want to say that there are 50 countries who are thinking one way, 140 another way. No. There are like-minded countries. There are countries who have another understanding of internet, seeing it more as a way of inter, uh, interfering with their domestic affairs, brainwashing their citizens and so on. And there are about 100 countries in between who haven't decided yet which way to go. And it's our obligation as like-minded and developed states to talk to them, to explain to them, to, to, to convince them that our understanding of the future of the use of ICTs is good for their nations, for their people, for their economy, for their whole countries. Thank you. Could I just add on what Marina said, that uh, it's important not to see this in UN terms only, where you have the group of 77 versus the group B and so forth. They're very important countries like Brazil, India, South Africa, which are democracies and which want openness on the internet. So while Russia and China tend to be authoritarians who want to have tight control, there are many other countries which are not part of the so-called West, but who want that values of open internet. And that means that of the countries that haven't yet become interested or knowledgeable about the internet, it's important they not be recruited by the authoritarians to a closed internet block, but that we open ways in which Brazil and Argentina and India and others can help bring those countries along. Um, before we end, we're almost running out of time, but um, I want to ask you something that is sometimes a bit far from us, uh, diplomats perhaps, some people will say, and that is action, taking action. We are also good in taking action. And the question in this, resp in this respect is about deterrence. The attacks are hard to, att to, to uh, find, they are uh, very easy to uh, prepare and to instigate. And uh, the general uh, sentiment, I think, is that uh, the other side is not deterred. They don't fear any kind of consequences. So do we need to have a big stick in this case to create also in the norms discussion? Well, I, I wrote an article uh, a year ago or two called How Does Deterrence Work in Cyberspace? And in the Cold War with nuclear weapons, we always thought of deterrence as uh, I know where that missile came from, I saw the big bang of the explosion, and I will reply in kind. Uh, that deterrence by retaliation or punishment is part of what we need to do in cyberspace. There's also deterrence by denial, which we saw a lot about this morning, raising the level of our uh, defenses so that the work that the opponent has to take is too much, it's not valuable. There's also deterrence by norms that we talked about, and there's also deterrence by entanglement, which works for some countries uh, like China, where uh, it would be very expensive to them to break apart the the internet. So there are a variety of means of deterrence, but the deterrence by punishment has to be part of it. And frankly, I think we're going to have to find something beyond just the sanctions which the U.S. applied against Russia in the aftermath of the 2016 elections. We're going to have to take some stronger steps to get their attention, but then we want to try to see if we can follow that with diplomacy. I can only add that if you haven't read Jew's article, please do it. It's, it's absolutely excellent and gives a clear picture of deterrence and, and I agree with every word written in that article. What I'd like to stress, I'd like to say that uh, as UN members, we have Article 51, inherent right of self-defense. Nobody, oh, no, nobody can question, it's there. 
And what, what's important is important to say that whatever we do, we stay within international law. That's the basic. And we all have the right to defend our countries. And personally, I think that it's very good that finally we have started open discussion about offensive capabilities. We have, uh, Australia was the first country to start it. Now, it, uh, now it has been followed by NATO, NATO member states. My country, Estonia, is talking about offensive capabilities. It's important because the bad guys, they believe in what they see and hear. And they have to know that we are serious about it. I'd like to use the expression that our chief of staff used when Crimea was occupied and the green men were discovered in Crimea. Then the question was posed to him. What do you do when you see green men in Estonia? His answer was, we'll shoot them. As a foreign minister, I was not able to repeat that. But what I want to say, we have to be determined, we have to be very clear. If something happens, we respond. So far, unfortunately, we haven't seen such a determination from, from the part of states. Thank you very much for that. We have only a few seconds, and I would like to ask you, the, I, I like very much the norm entrepreneur uh, phrase. And since Israel is considered innovative enterprising, what kind of tips would you give to our audience, the researchers, the practitioners, those who are not very familiar with the issue of norms, if they want to be norms entrepreneurs, what would you say? Well, I think uh, uh, a lot of what we saw this morning, uh, which is uh, the ability to make the target hard and to have resilience, can have an important deterring effect. It's easier to, uh, to enforce a norm when uh, basically it's hard to cheat on the norm. So de deterrence by denial and making, our, making a, a us less easy, a less easy target is a good part of what somebody can do. And then there's always the academics trying to think of norms, but, but the technicians and the people we heard this morning saying, here's how we change the workload so that the bad guys have a harder workload. Uh, and that, I think, is an important part of it. I would add that uh, being creative, thinking out of the box, and talking to other communities. If you're a technical person, talk to lawyers, talk to a civil society, if you come from government, talk to private sector, but be open and listen and learn from others. Thank you very much. Uh, great observations and tips. Thank you for that. Thank you for your time and thank you too.